On today's show, James Harden publicly calls Daryl Morey a liar. How the Rockets dodged an absolutely massive bullet with a potential James Harden reunion and how the fallout with the 76ers could potentially benefit the Rockets down the line and more. It's all coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Throw it up to Jalen Green. Chagoon here in the short row. Oh my, that's the no look. Jabari for three and the win. Yeah! Look at Tari Eason. Cookies. Here comes Tari. No! T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. The Houston Rockets select Amen Thompson and Cam Whitmore. One thing I have never done is not made the playoffs, and so we want to take that step here as well. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcast, including YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe. Now, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked on. Make every moment more visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started and as always thank you so much for making locked on rockets part of your day every single day whether it's on the way to work on your lunch break in the gym thank you for making lor part of your day every single day what insane bombshell news to hit the nba landscape with james harden publicly calling out daryl morey saying that he is a liar and that he will never be a part of an organization that he's a part of ever again. I want to run the clip back so that you can hear it yourself, so you can see it yourself. It's not fake. It's not Photoshop. It's not AI. James Harden went out there and completely condemned Daryl Morey. If you had told me, like, we are on such a wild ride of these last three years. Ever since James, James Harden's exodus from Houston all those years ago, It's just been one thing after another with him. And we have seen the types of, we've seen the act that he has put on to get what he wants to get out of a bad situation. This is full blown scorched earth, no punches pulled. This is the most that he has ever done to get himself out of a situation that he didn't want to be in. So let me run this clip back and then we're going to like set the table for those who are maybe a little bit unfamiliar with the situation and why the 76ers are where they are right now and how James Harden and Daryl Morey got to this point, how the Rockets dodged a massive bullet with a potential James Harden reunion and how the 76ers fallout could potentially benefit the Rockets a little bit further down the line. So let's go ahead and run this clip so you can see just how insane it is to watch James Harden call out Daryl Morey in real time. Uh, Daryl Morey is a liar. And I will never be a part of an organization that he's a part of. Let me say that again. Daryl Morey is a liar, and I will never be a part of an organization that he's a part of. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. It's it's not that he it's not that he did it. It's still insane that he did it. It's insane that he doubled down on it. He was like, let me say that again. Like, just just so that there's no, did he really mean it? Was he, like, was he trying to say something? He goes, let me say that again and drops the, Daryl Morey is a liar. <laughs> just completely doubles down on it and points it out to the crowd. He's like, no, no, no. Let me just, I want to be perfectly clear. Daryl Morey is a liar. Okay. So now that we've seen the clip, We've got the initial reactions to this insanity out of the way. Why is this the situation? So basically, if you're unfamiliar, James Harden took a pay cut with the 76ers last summer. And he did so so that the Sixers could go out and sign some additional pieces so that they could run it back this year and be a better, more well-rounded team, right? That's how they got P.J. Tucker. They went out and got Daniel House Jr. They, They went out and got some pieces to flesh out the roster. And James Harden took a significant pay cut for the 76ers to be able to do that. Then you start to move forward through this season and you get all the smoke, all the rumors, all the reporting about 
the potential interest from James Harden and his camp in a Houston reunion, right? And that was very that was legitimate interest on both sides. Houston wanted James Harden back. James Harden wanted to come back to Houston. So that seemed like our potentially his number one plan. If if actually it seemed like his only plan at the time because he seemed very hell-bent on returning to Houston and it didn't really seem like there was a second option for James. It didn't really seem like he wanted to stay in Philadelphia. We have the reports and the rumors of his unhappiness there, that he was disgruntled, that he didn't like the style, that he was upset with Doc, that he didn't like playing with, you know, that he didn't get along great with Embiid. He wanted to get back to playing his way. All these different things, right? So it seemed like from the middle part of this past season, that was just the understood outcome of this past year, right? Is that James Harden was going to come back to Houston. The part of the like calculus that I don't think James or anybody in his camp or anybody really expected was for the Rockets to actually say, you know what? Nah, we're good. We, sorry, James, we're good. We, we, we've got other plans. We don't see you in those plans. Sorry, man. And so when that happened, James then kind of circled back and started, you know, putting his efforts back into, hey, Daryl, hey, Philly, like, What's going on? Like, can I stay here? Can y'all give me that Supermax? Ex- or can y'all go ahead and, you know, sign me to the uh, the Supermax deal and and I'll just I'll just hang out here for the next four years? And because there was an understanding previously that Philly would make James Harden whole, I'm assuming, kind of a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, handshake deal under the table, whatever. Harden and his camp and, and kind of basically kind of cheating on that deal, right? By by sourcing Houston, by by gauging interest there, and by making it seem like that was his preferred destination, right? That was his preferred outcome, was to go back to Houston. I think the 76ers probably looked at that, and they were like, well, no. Like, you were going to leave us if Houston said yes. So why would we give you the deal that we were planning to give you a summer ago? You're not committed to us. Why should we be committed to you? So then that happens. James doesn't have a deal from Houston. He doesn't have the the full four-year deal from the 76ers. So he's sitting there talking to Daryl, and he's trying to figure out, well, what the hell are we going to do? What's going on? What? How do we get out of this mess? And Daryl's like, well, I mean, you could opt into your contract and can try to trade you somewhere. And all the trade offers for Harden kind of suck, right? Like the only offer that's even remotely relevant is the Clippers, and it's kind of a poo-poo platter offer at this point. So Daryl's been in this position before. He's not going to trade James Harden for 25 cents on the dollar, and he probably had to sit down James or probably had to tell him, hey, man, there's not really a trade for you right now, so I need you to come into camp, and I need you to actually play until closer to the deadline so that we can maybe actually find you a deal because right now there's there's nothing out there and I'm not going to trade you for nothing. And so that kind of brings us to where we are now, where James Harden is a guy who every single time he's been upset or disgruntled in a situation, he has done whatever tactics he's deemed necessary, whether it's showing up late to training camp, whether it's partying out in Vegas and Atlanta, whether it's phoning it in on the basketball court, whatever it, you know, whatever he's had to do, he has done to get out of situations repeatedly, whether it was with Houston, whether it was with Brooklyn, now it's with the 76ers. And we also have Daryl Morey, who has been in this situation a number of times with stars getting uncomfortable with trying to figure out the best case best way to move forward and he stalled out the Ben Simmons situation he's probably going to stall out the James Harden situation too and get the best possible return he can actually get for the 76ers so that kind of brings us to where we are right now and it's just such an insane situation to to even think that we would would have found ourselves in all these years ago because the one guy who has always had James Harden's back has been Daryl Morey, right? Took out a full-page ad in the paper when it was time for him to leave the Rockets, thanking the city, the organization, but mostly thanking James Harden. Um, He has time and time again had James Harden's back, right? He wanted to reunite with James. He went out, he got him, he brought him to Philadelphia, And that was probably his plan all along when he took the 76ers job was he had his eyes on getting James Harden to Philly and he made that happen. 
And James has finally turned on the one guy who's always had his back. Now, is James Harden in the right here? Is Daryl Morey in the right here? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of gray area. I don't think it's as simple as just one guy's right and one guy is wrong because of all the information that I've gone ahead and laid out. I want to continue to navigate this because I think the situation is just so interesting, so perplexing, so insane to think about. And I want to continue to navigate it, share some continued thoughts on it, as well as, again, getting to the point as it relates back to the Houston Rockets, why it's a good thing that James Harden is nowhere near this young core, and how the 76ers fallout might actually benefit the Rockets. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The football season is about to kick off, and FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long. That's right, all season long. Because right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time they win in the regular season. Just pick any team to win the Super Bowl, and you'll get bonus bets for every victory along the way. Right now, looking at Super Bowl 58 outright favorites, Kansas City Chiefs plus 600 to win it all, Philadelphia Eagles at plus 800, and rounding out the top five, you have the Buffalo Bills, Cincinnati Bengals, and San Francisco 49ers at plus 1,000 apiece. So be sure to pick one of those teams or further down on the list if you want to, and every single win they get during the regular season, you will get bonus bets back, and you can use your bonus bets on spreads, player props, over-unders, and so much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sportsbook. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. And continuing on here at Locked On Rockets. Man, just trying to continue to wrap our heads around this James Harden, Daryl Morey situation. And, and one immediate takeaway is just, thank goodness this is no longer the Rockets problem. That's... That's number one. And this was like a weight that was lifted when James Harden was first traded away from Houston and then watching other fan bases have to try and defend Harden and his antics, whether it was with the Nets, with the Sixers, whatever. Just being able to wipe your hands clean of that after almost a decade, right, of defending James Harden on social media and standing up for him and dealing with all 29 other fan bases coming at the Rockets every single day. I mean, they still come at the Rockets, but like, you know, not because of James Harden. And it's just seeing this situation play out in real time. And it's, it's not Houston's problem. Although it's nice to be able to sit here as an outside uh, observer and just be like, damn, this situation's crazy. So I, I'm torn here because there has been a very clear, distinct pattern that has followed James Harden for some time now, right? Where he gets, he largely gets whatever he wants. He's gone to a number of different situations and he's gotten his requests fulfilled, right? Every single time. He wanted Chris Paul, the Rockets went and got Chris Paul. He wanted Russell Westbrook, they went and got Russell Westbrook. He wanted out of Houston, he got... Got traded. He wanted to be partnered with Kevin Durant, right? In in Brooklyn. He awesome. He went to he went to Brooklyn. That was the destination that Houston traded him to. Um, he wanted to be reunited with Daryl Morey, so he lands in Philadelphia, right? He gets there. Now he wants out of Philadelphia. He's probably gonna get his way at some point. However, it's also worth noting that um Based on how the CBA works, a player who does not like report for basketball activities or duties and does not honor their contract is basically in breach of contract or something along those lines. And uh, that player cannot do anything, cannot sign with another team, cannot whatever, in, unless the current team uh, decides to move on from him, wave him, do whatever. Uh, basically, the 76ers control James Harden's future. So he either reports to the 76ers or he doesn't ever play basketball again is kind of the situation at hand right now. Um, I'm torn because it's very clear that, and I'm, I'm curious, I want to know your thoughts, right? Whose side are you on here? Are you on James Harden's side? Are you on Daryl Morey's side in this whole situation? Because you go back to this, you go back to James Harden sacrificing all that money to make the 76ers a better team. Cool. 
and the 76ers were supposed to make him whole at the end of that. I get that. But if Harden was like flirting with the Rockets the whole time and wanted to come back to Houston, it was the NBA's worst kept secret all season long, then I think it kind of ruins the the honor within the original deal, right? The original deal, there was an agreement on both sides. Hey, we'll take care of you. Cool. Thanks for sacrificing this money. I think that agreement gets thrown to the side the moment that James Harden starts flirting with Houston and putting his eye, you know, eyes on greener pastures or wanting to come home, all that stuff. But then Daryl also lied. Like Daryl said, you know, hey, I'll take care of you, right? I, I got you. We'll make you whole. And then he probably also told him again, hey, opt into the contract. I'll try and trade you. I'll find you a place. And then had to tell him again, like, it's it's not happening. You're coming to camp. So that's like twice that Daryl has had to lie to James in a very short time frame that has then forced James Harden to go full scorched earth. Daryl Morey is a liar. This is an insane situation. It's gonna be it's gonna be fireworks just watching this one play out. Cause the Ben Simmons situation was at least quite a bit more passive, where it was just like, okay, Ben is dealing with back issues and or mental health issues, and he's just not gonna be a part of the team until we can figure out what we're gonna do with him. James Harden is about to be as toxic as possible to get out of Philadelphia. And that I want to highlight is one of the key reasons that I am so glad that he is nowhere near this Rockets organization with this young core and credit to Ime Odoka, credit to Rafael Stone, credit to everybody that had to do with the decision to say no to James Harden this time around. Cause it would have been really, really easy to say yes. This is an organization. The Rockets have been the laughing stock of the NBA for multiple years running now. They want to be competitive. They want to get back to a place of relevancy. And they could have very easily done it by just pulling the trigger on a James Harden deal and bringing him back. And a James Harden deal would not have been that much more expensive than a Fred Van Vliet deal. They could have still probably done all the other moves that they did and also walked away with James Harden, who in a vacuum is better than Fred Van Vliet. You can't even, there is no argument there. James Harden is the better player than Fred Van Vliet. But as we pointed out, as we discussed in countless episodes and everything leading up to free agency and the decision and the direction that the Rockets ultimately went, Fred Van Vliet makes so much more sense for so many other reasons based on the intangibles, right? The leadership aspects that he brings to the table, even the defense, some of the -the on-the-court stuff that he can do. Uh, He's a more uh, versatile on-the-court piece because he can be played on-ball, off-ball, He's a piece that can very easily conceivably be moved uh, to the bench or to another organization traded uh, a year from now if Amin Thompson is ready to take over the reins and actually start running the show for the Rockets. So for all these different reasons, but most importantly, it's just the the attitude element of James Harden, right? And I know it, it feels weird because I see people make the point that his teammates, all you know, all his ex-teammates love him. They all speak so highly of him, all this stuff. And, and that can be true, right? James can be a fantastic teammate at times to these guys, but also still be an incredibly toxic personality that they have to deal with when it comes to their jobs, right? What they do on the basketball court. And you look at what the Rockets are trying to establish here, the vision that they have with Ime Udoka and the direction for this next phase of their rebuilding process. And to hang all of that on all of the success of that on whether or not James Harden is just ultimately happy in this situation when history has shown us that at the, the moment that James Harden is unhappy, he will do whatever it takes to remedy the situation no matter how bad it looks. And that has happened time and time again. He has thrown tantrums. He has demanded trades. He's demanded players be traded. He's tried to get out of situations that he doesn't deem fit anymore. And it's just really, he's done a lot of damage to his legacy over the, over these years since he left the Rockets, right? He could have just stayed in Houston. He could have never demanded a trade. He would have had a statue built outside Toyota Center, all of that. And it's just been one thing after another ever since he left Houston. And now he's trying to leave yet another situation, which is probably his best situation to win a championship unless he does somehow get to the uh, Clippers and they don't wind up having to gouge their entire roster to make it happen. 
I mean, the 76ers are his best shot to win a title right now. Last year was his best chance, the probably the best team he's ever been on since the 17-18 Rockets to win a title alongside Joel Embiid and still couldn't make it happen. Coming up, I want to share some final thoughts on the harden Mori situation, as well as how the fallout for the 76ers could ultimately benefit the Rockets and some additional news and notes about Cooper Flag, the potential consensus, potential consensus, whatever, uh, top 2025 NBA draft prospect and how the Rockets could potentially get their hands on him with the pick swaps further down the line via the Brooklyn Nets and a couple other things here and there. We're going to get there in just one moment. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets. Now, what I do want to highlight here, we spoke in a recent episode about Joel Embiid. And the fact that he is smack dab in the middle of his prime right now. And how Daryl Morey and the 76ers navigate this James Harden situation may ultimately impact uh, his future, right? Or it, it, it will definitely impact his future and whether or not he wants to stay in Philadelphia long term, right? He did a recent interview where he was talking about he wants to win a championship, doesn't know whether it'll be with Philadelphia or not, right? He is one of those top, 10 talents in the NBA that the moment he requests a trade or asks out whatever the Rockets have to have their eyes on it and try to try to make, you know, try to make a splash, right? And maybe make a move towards Embiid. Now I will say, I will say this much. I don't think the Rockets should make any move for any disgruntled star player until next summer at the absolute earliest. I was even on the fence about whether or not they needed to potentially make a move for Jalen Brown, and then Brown signed his, you know, insane Supermax extension, so it doesn't matter anymore. But the Rockets have a young core, and they still don't know what they have of this young core, right? They don't know if Jalen can be the guy. They don't know what Alper and Shingun can be. They don't know who Jabari Smith is. They don't know so much about their young, talented pieces. And that's what this first year is about. It's about Ime Udoka identifying who are the mainstay pieces, who are the pieces that they absolutely want to stick to moving forward, and what complementary pieces you need around those guys, or whether maybe Jalen isn't the number one guy on a championship contender, but maybe he's a really, really good number two, right? Maybe the Rockets don't have a number one guy in this bunch. And if you come to that conclusion at the end of this next year, then yeah, that's when some tough decisions have to be made where maybe you package two or three of these young guys together to go get yourself a number one guy like a Joel Embiid or like a Zion Williamson if he's still on the market, whatever. Point is, the Rockets should take this first year with Ime and just have it be for research. Obviously, they want to be successful. They want to make it to the playoffs, play in, all of that. They want to have a much better year than they've had over these last three seasons, for sure. But you don't want to jump the gun on a mid-season trade or on a trade before the season even starts. And, oh, well, this shiny, exciting player might become available and we just got to gut this whole roster because then that's how you get into a situation where if you were to make a trade for Embiid right now and you did, like, Shingoon, Tari, Cam Whitmore for Embiid, and then suddenly two or all three of those guys turn into all-stars, then you're going to look like you're going to be clowned on for doing that. So the 76ers fall out can be beneficial to the Rockets further down the line because it's going to further destabilize that organization and hopefully the timeline sync up to where Embiid and Houston would be a really, really solid option to get back to relevancy, right? And the Rockets are chock full of young talent to be able to make a trade for Embiid if he does ask out. There are a bunch of other teams that the Rockets would have to beat out as far as offers go. Uh, The Utah Jazz, the OKC Thunder, there's a lot of other teams that could make a very compelling offer for Joel Embiid, for sure. But we also know that Ime Odoka has coached Joel Embiid before. There's a pre-existing relationship there. I don't know. I I think there may come a time further down the line where we're talking heavily about Joel Embiid to Houston rumors further down the line. The other option for the 76ers, though, is they could just fire Daryl Morey or get him to, like, walk away. They could just, like, to try and resolve things with James Harden. 
but that's just further bending over backwards and catering to a guy that has always gotten his way. And it's going to be cur- it's going to be really interesting to see what direction the 76ers go, whether they side with Daryl Morey and continue to let him do his thing and make the situation uncomfortable, all of that. Um, or if they say, you know what? Daryl's taking this thing way too far. We need to remedy the situation and, you know, heal this relationship with James Harden so that we can get back to competing with this current squad because this is our best chance to win a title and even trading James Harden is not going to put us is not going to bring us closer to a championship this next season. That whole situation's insane. Uh the situation's crazy. I don't think it can be fixed. There we go. I've been meaning to drop that line in here this entire episode. Um yeah, it's I just I can't wrap my head around it, man. It's so You know what? Not our problem. It was the off season though, and it was an insane situation. Wanted to be able to talk about it a little bit. Um, some good old Rockets legends, James Harden and Daryl Morey, going head to head in Philadelphia, battle of the century. Uh, I will say it's also funny to see James. He continues on doing like the China like press tour that he's doing, and he's just like he's posting IG, you know, IG posts, Twitter posts, videos of him just having fun in China after the Daryl Morey call out video, like nothing's happened. He's just tweeting like normal. Like, yeah, I'm just having a great time in China. Happy to see my fans living, you know, living my best life, uh, live, laugh, love all that good stuff. And that's a very James Harden. It's like a textbook James Harden strategy. It's just so funny to witness. I will say a couple more things that I wanted to chime in here. Uh, Cooper flag, who is projected to be, uh, he's one of the top, or the top high school player in America right now, one of the top high school players in America, he reclassified to the 2025, or I guess he reclassified to 2024, which means he'll be in the 2025 NBA draft. And I just wanted to point out that even though the Rockets are hopefully what we think is going to be on the upswing here shortly and playing competitive basketball again and all that stuff, they still have the Brooklyn Nets picks available. And those are still rolling in. So whether or not they use those in a trade further than the line or whether they just hold on to them, kind of similar to how the Boston Celtics held on to the Nets picks and were able to make some selections along the way to bolster their roster, you know, being able to hold on to those picks as the Nets kind of look like they're in no man's land, it really doesn't look like they're, I mean, they're probably barely going to be a 500 team if that. I I think they're going to be even worse than a 500 team this next season, and things could get worse even further after that. They own the Nets pick outright here in 2024, so wherever the pick lands, the Rockets have that. And then in 2025, the Rockets owe their pick to the Thunder from the Chris Paul-Russell Westbrook swap, but they also have the pick swap available to them from the Brooklyn Nets. So... Should the Brooklyn Nets struggle again in 2025 or be a bad team in 2025, the Thunder might be able to snag the Rockets pick if the Rockets are a worse team than the Thunder, but then the Rockets can take whatever is left over out of that Rockets-Thunder pick swap and then flip it with the Brooklyn Nets if their pick is better. Now, it's also worth noting that the Rockets pick swap to the Thunder is top 20 protected that year, I believe. Uh, I was looking that up earlier. I I believe it said top 20 protected. So we'll see whether or not that pick swap even matters or conveys that year. But the Nets angle of things are very important, right? And monitoring and seeing how the Nets progress over this next little while. I mean, the Rockets could find themselves in the very fortuitous position of being on the upswing and still garnering more exciting young talent to add to an already exciting young talented core via the Brooklyn Nets. And that's the unique position that you find yourself in when you don't have your own draft picks, but you own somebody else's draft picks. You can be a good team while that other team sucks. And then you'll still be adding key pieces along the way, right? The... uh, the New Orleans Pelicans were kind of in that boat this past season a little bit. So, you know, that via the, you know, the trades that they got for Drew Holiday and Anthony Davis, they've collected and amassed a ton of draft capital to where while other teams are playing poorly, they're able to walk away with their heads held high and be a competitive team and actually have some decent draft capital moving forward. So, 
That's something to be on the lookout for. Cooper Flag 2025. I know it's much further down the line. I just wanted to put the bug in your ear right now. And then the very last thing is, uh, I guess Jabari Smith Jr. and Tari Eason might be starting a podcast together. They were kind of joking about it on Twitter, but I'm curious. This will be the bonus question of the day. If Jabari and Tari were to start a podcast together, what would you want them to call it? What are some name ideas that you would have for a Jabari and Tari podcast that they do together? Let us know in the YouTube comments. Give us your thoughts on the Harden, Maury, beef debate, all of that in the YouTube comments. But as always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Daryl Morey is a liar.